tonight on 16 by 9 pills to treat depression these are drugs that can cause you to commit violence that might cause violent behavior this boy was never murderous or violent uh, before he was put on Prozac or not work at all no clinical benefit that's clinically meaningful for most patients and the drug companies that knew about it all along I mean, these companies are in business to make profits and forget the same old beach vacation what we want to do is open up space flight to humanity book a trip on a spaceship then behind the lens ask me a question boss let's talk let's chit chat with one of Canada's most famous and entertaining photographers. Blah, blah, blah. Come on, little buddy. Let's go. Here's Carolyn Jarvis. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. It's a terrible irony. A drug meant to relieve depression that may actually make you violent. Antidepressants are among the most popular drugs sold in Canada, with more than 40 million prescriptions filled every year. But a growing course of experts say the pills don't work as promised. And as Sean O'Shea tells us, drug companies knew all along there could be serious reactions. At this home on the edge of a windswept field near Winnipeg, a strange tragedy unfolded. One afternoon in September 2009, three teenage friends gathered in the garage for a smoke. Suddenly, without provocation, one of the teens pulled a knife from underneath a blanket and plunged it into the chest of his friend, 15-year-old Seth Ottenbright. As Ottenbright was dying, his killer seemed as stunned as everyone else at what he'd just done. He seemed detached from the fact that he had stabbed his friend. Gene Zazelenchuk represents the youth who can't be identified because he's a young offender. They were in and out of each other's houses over the years. This wasn't somebody he disliked. It turns out the young killer was taking a heavy dose of the antidepressant drug Prozac. The medical evidence that I have seen has squarely puts the blame for this entire tragedy on Prozac. That was the same conclusion drawn by a Manitoba judge who presided over the boy's sentencing hearing. The judge agreed with expert witness Dr. Peter Bregan, an American psychiatrist. What was it about Prozac that you think caused that death? This boy was never murderous or violent uh, before he was put on Prozac. Health Canada actually has a warning about giving Prozac to children stating that it causes, in effect, an agitation syndrome. In fact, antidepressants are suspected to have been involved in mass shootings at Columbine, Virginia Tech, Colorado, and Tucson, among others. Well, we know that in over 90% of uh, the school are mass shootings. The perpetrator is usually on one or other of the antidepressants or the mood stabilizes. Dr. David Healy is a professor of psychiatry in Wales and one of the world's leading critics of antidepressants. These are drugs that can cause you to commit violence. And yet antidepressants are among the most popular drugs in the world. Canadians take 40 million antidepressant prescriptions worth 1.7 billion dollars every year. Global sales of mental health drugs are worth more than 80 billion dollars. And while Healy admits they work for some people, and he even prescribes them to patients, he believes only one in 10 people taking these drugs should be on them. They can make you severely agitated. They can make you agitated to the point where you become suicidal. They can also, at the same rate, make you homicidal. But side effects aren't the only concern. Some studies found antidepressants didn't have any effect at all in relieving depression. People who are suffering from mild to moderate depression, the data that we have shows that they don't get any benefit at all from the drug. No benefit. They would do just as well on a placebo. Irving Kirsch is a Harvard University medical researcher who has studied the clinical trial data submitted to U.S. regulators of some of the most popular antidepressants on the market. 
what we found was that the difference between drug and placebo was very, very small. It was so small that it would not be meaningful in anybody's life. It was what we call clinically insignificant. Kirsch's research is supported by drug companies' own internal documents, many of which 16 by 9 obtained. These documents from the maker of Prozac drug company Eli Lilly conclude that in early clinical trials, none of the eight patients who completed the four-week treatment showed distinct drug-induced improvement. And there have been a fairly large number of reports of adverse reactions. You did look at the clinical trials for a number of these drugs. I did indeed. Prozac. No benefit that's clinically meaningful beyond the placebo for most patients. But Prozac isn't the only antidepressant where clinical trial results concluded the drug was ineffective. Internal trials done by Pfizer on its antidepressant drug Zoloft found there is still no striking evidence of beneficial drug effect, with placebo often being the superior treatment. Value of Zoloft? No clinical benefit that's clinically meaningful for most patients. Pfizer declined our interview request to discuss Zoloft, but sent a statement saying, in part, there is extensive science supporting the safety and efficacy of Zoloft. Don't some of these drugs help some of the patients, at least some of the time? They might, but our data, actually the drug company data, indicate that at best, they might be helping 10 to 15% of the patients. 85 to 90% of the patients are not getting a clinically meaningful benefit from the drug they're taking. But evidence the medication can be ineffective isn't the only thing disclosed in internal company documents. They also reveal troubling side effects. This Eli Lilly document from 1979 says some patients on Prozac have converted from severe depression to agitation within a few days. Why would you approve a drug for depression that's going to cause agitation, throw you into an agitated depression, which is the most dangerous state in psychiatry, practically? Another Eli Lilly report said, in trials, 38% of Prozac-treated patients reported new activation, which was double those on a placebo. Dr. Bregan says activation, nervousness, anxiety, or insomnia is dangerous. And when he saw internal Eli Lilly documents, he discovered something interesting about Prozac. In fact, it was so stimulating that Eli Lilly cheated and started giving patients tranquilizers, addictive tranquilizers, while they were taking Prozac. That was against the rules. Eli Lilly declined 16 by 9's request for an interview to discuss Prozac, saying in a statement, there is rigorous scientific evidence of the efficacy of antidepressants. Serious side effects like agitation might have played a role in the murder of Seth Ottenbright. Seth was stabbed by a 16-year-old friend who had been put on Prozac after his parents worried about him using recreational drugs. There was an almost immediate detrimental effect to their son after the initial Prozac prescription. Within the next two weeks, the boy attempts suicide and also on another occasion mutilates himself by slashing his arm. Alarmed by his deterioration, the parents took the boy to another doctor who increased the Prozac dosage. During that three weeks from the increase in the dosage of Prozac to the time of the tragic death, his behavior just became more and more bizarre. After the murder, the young man was imprisoned and went off Prozac, and his agitation stopped. If he walked in that door, he probably wouldn't think that there's anything wrong or strange or different about him. Next, why troubling side effects didn't stop companies from getting pills to market. You don't have to show a lot of value for a drug to be approved. They go by names like Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil. They are antidepressants, one of the most commonly prescribed medications in the world, even though tests show they could be ineffective and can have potent side effects. But those side effects didn't stop the drugs from making it to market. You don't have to show a lot of value for a drug to be approved. 
Dr. Joel Lection is a professor of health policy at York University in Toronto and an expert on the regulation of drugs. All you have to really show is that it's better than nothing and it's relatively safe. For a drug to get the green light, it has to pass government regulators such as Health Canada or the FDA in the U.S. Yet these regulators have approved drugs if the companies can produce evidence from clinical trials that show the pills work better than a placebo. So drug company has two studies that show that there's a benefit as a result of this drug, but it's got 10 studies that show that there's a problem with this drug. Does the drug get approved? The drug certainly could still get approved. Harvard University researcher Irving Kirsch says this happens all the time because the FDA only requires two positive trials. Are two clinical trials showing moderate benefit sufficient in your view? The problem is that the negative trials, the ones that don't show any difference between drug and placebo, those are just not looked at, they're thrown out, they're not considered. And regulators have approved antidepressants, even when they know the drug is weak. In 1991, the FDA approved Zoloft, despite FDA's own reviewers being unhappy with the drug because of its lack of robustness, saying it has some potential advantages. Dr. Peter Bregan has seen these FDA documents on Zoloft. What I know with certainty is that the FDA didn't really want to approve the drug but felt that because it just somehow managed statistically to look significant, they felt they had to approve it. In Canada, it's hard to know what is required for a drug to be approved because the Health Canada branch that assesses drugs doesn't divulge how it reaches its decisions. If you ask for information about how they made the decision, what kind of process did they go through, they'll refuse. It may be very good. It may have lots of flaws, but it's a black box right now. Health Canada refused to talk to us about the drug approval process, but this woman would. Dr. Michelle Brill Edwards is a former senior physician at Health Canada who advised on the safety of drugs. She claims Health Canada's decisions are influenced by the fact that drug companies pay a good portion of the budget of the drug approval branch. This policy of uh, fee for uh, uh, service really does put the drug companies on top. They are the people to be pleased. Brill Edwards resigned from Health Canada in the mid-90s because she felt the agency wasn't performing its job. One of her complaints was its lack of transparency. The secrecy afforded to uh, companies is uh, extraordinary and completely against the public interest. Drug companies have also employed academics to help them mask the results of poor clinical trials. GlaxoSmithKline, the makers of the antidepressant Paxil, wanted to be able to sell the drug to children and adolescents. They funded a trial called Study 329, but it didn't turn out as hoped. Essentially, the study did not really show Paxil was effective in treating adolescent depression, which is not something we want to publicize, says this internal email from the company's PR firm. They said, but we can't show this data to the wider world. We can't even show it to the regulator. The chair of the psychiatry department at Brown University, Martin Keller, oversaw the project. He agreed to put his name on an academic paper ghostwritten by GlaxoSmithKline, which said, the findings of this study provide evidence of the efficacy and safety of SSRI Paxil in the treatment of adolescent depression. So study 329, was a prime example of how you can take a trial which shows that a drug doesn't work and produce a paper seeming to indicate that it is a major breakthrough in the treatment of depression for adolescents. Last year, GlaxoSmithKline pled guilty to criminal charges and was fined $3 billion, due in part to promoting Paxil to children and adolescents based on the misleading Study 329 results. 16 by 9 asked GlaxoSmithKline for an on-camera interview, but the company turned down our request. In fact, all of the companies mentioned in this story declined to come on camera and simply commented that their drugs are proven to be safe and effective. Just this week, Health Minister Leona Iglukak announced changes to the reporting of adverse drug reactions. 
There is important work underway to improve Health Canada's ability to monitor the safety of drugs while they are on the market. But Health Canada hasn't promised to make any changes to how those drugs get approved in the first place. I mean, these companies are in business to make profits. Certainly, they know how poor the data is. They know how small the difference is in, between drug and placebo. They know that their drugs don't work for the majority of people to whom they are prescribed. So here's the deal. Is packing possible to show, in the short term even, that psychiatric drugs are helpful? It's impossible to show in the long run that they're helpful, and it's easy to show in every single study they're harmful. Next, buckle your seatbelt for a ride to the edge of space. This is cozy. Yeah, 